In this video, I'm going to show you a simple experiment which will allow you to get to grips with the different tonal values that can be achieved with watercolour paint. So this video is broken down into three parts. To begin with, I'm going to take you through a simple colour experiment which will allow you to get used to how watercolours behave. Secondly, I'm going to briefly describe what I see as the main problem with watercolour, especially if you're coming to watercolour as a first timer or, you know, perhaps you haven't painted with it for a while and you're used to using oils and or acrylic. And then finally, I'll show you how I go about solving the problem in a very simple fashion. So I'm going to use uh, this Winsor & Newton this is professional watercolour, comes in a tube as you can see. And these are slightly more expensive than the, the pans of watercolour that you get in the kits. But of course, you don't need to buy a full set of tubes. And consequently, you know, I think it's pretty good value for money, to be honest. Um, you could just get yourself a set of primary colours and a couple of browns or something to start off with. And it's a good way to just see what can be achieved with watercolour. And in particular, for the first step of this little experiment, you can see I've squeezed a little blob of the paint onto my watercolour paper here, and I've got a flat brush, and it's just ever so slightly wet. So I'm going to begin by just moving that around to create a patch of CAD, pure CAD yellow. Now, the reason I'm doing this is, generally speaking, I would say with watercolour, the biggest challenge is achieving darker, stronger tonal values. You know, very pale values are super easy to achieve. You just add a ton of water. Um, so really, the tube watercolours allow you to achieve bolder colours if you use them pretty much straight out of the tube. And that's really going to be the limitation of the tonal range you get in your painting. So if you can get yourself used straight away to how dark can I go, then everything else I believe is going to more or less follow from that. OK, so I've moved that around a bit um, so that it's not overly thick on the paper. And you can see I've still obviously got some paint on my brush. I've got my uh, pot of water here. I'm simply going to dip that into the water and then taking the paint that's left on the brush create another little patch of colour here. And then I'm going to do the same again, one dip of the paint remaining on the brush into the water and then another dip. And obviously the colour is becoming more and more dilute. And then I'm just going to wash the brush out. I mean, you can do that as many times as you, as you want, but just to save time, I'm just going to put a slightly paler colour on there. Now, there's a very, very gradual reduction in strength of tone as I move from right to left. But it's a very simple and easy way to just kind of get used to what each of your colours can produce for you on the paper. So I've just rinsed the brush out now, so that's clean water, and I can even just use that, Just I'll just lift off a little bit of that, and obviously you can go paler and paler and paler until you've got almost nothing but water. Now, having done that with CAD Yellow, I would recommend doing it again with perhaps Ultramarine Blue and Cadmium Red. Well, as it turned out, I didn't actually have any cadmium red in my little kit of paints, to my, much to my surprise. So I did use ultramarine blue, but this is alizarin crimson. And you can see that um, I've done exactly the same thing as I did with the yellow. I came down a row on the yellow, so I just decided to, to mimic that because I started to run out of room on the left here um, with the blue and the red. And the thing to do now is let that completely dry, Ev let everything dry completely. OK, well, the paint uh, is certainly not dry in, you know, on the bottom edges of some of these patches of colour. And 
you know, really what you should do is just let everything dry completely and don't be tempted to do what I did and touch what, what you think is dry paint here and leave a finger mark. But, um, you know, that's kind of life with watercolour, really, and indeed art. So um, don't worry too much about it. So what I'm doing now is grabbing a bit of burnt umber. And I've got a slightly smaller flat brush. And what I can do now, again, is just get just the tiniest bit of water. And I can take this colour and I can just put a little patch of it on top of each of the now dry patches of colour that I've put down. And in doing this, that's going to allow me to see how the brown looks against the different tones I've got for each of the primary colours that I've used. Now, of course, you don't have to use red, blue and yellow for your initial patches of colour, and you don't have to use burnt umber for, your, for the colour that goes on top. But the point is to gradually become more and more aware of how the colours look next to each other. And you can see already that, for example, the brown looks very different against this pale blue compared to how it looks against the darker reds or indeed the darker blues. There's less of a change, I would say, when we put it against the yellow background. Even comparing the darkest yellow background to the very pale background, I personally don't think there's a huge amount of difference between the way the burnt umber looks. But having done that, we can try the same experiment with a different colour. So this one uh, that I'm putting on now is Burnt Sienna. So if we're just looking close up at the Burnt Sienna on the yellow, you can see it looks like quite an orangey brown there. But the same thing on the dark blue looks very much like a very deep burnt umber. I mean, these two patches are cut of colour, of paint rather, they are exactly the same colour, but look how different they look. You know, markedly different. And then if we come down to the red, again, it, it's a darker colour, but the red is showing through the burnt sienna. So looking at those three patches of the same paint, it really does give us some interesting information in terms of how they behave relative to the colour which is underneath it and also next to it, you know, how it tricks the eye into perceiving something different. So this is um, just orange, Wind Windsor and Newton orange. But again, we can see we get a different effect on the darker backgrounds compared to the light. So you can play these games almost forever because obviously you could do a whole range of different backgrounds and then a whole co different range of combinations of the second layer of paint and then a whole different range of dilutions for the second layer of paint that you put on top. So, you know, you, could, you might come to some concrete conclusions, but what I would say is no matter what, in the act of doing this little experiment, it's going to help you just kind of get to know your paints. It's just going to happen naturally, and that will happen the more paintings you do as well. So that's the first experiment that I would recommend for getting used to how watercolours behave in terms of a, a tonal experience. Now, just switching to thinking about oil paints or acrylic paint for the moment, if we represent I'm obviously using just an ink marker here, but if we if this little black square represents the darkest tone that you could achieve with acrylic or oil paint, and then this white square is obviously the, the lightest colour that you could achieve, and then somewhere in the middle, if I just simulate a uh, mid-grey, and then somewhere in the middle of those two on the right, if I simulate a darker grey just with some cross hatching, 
and then we'll put a pale grey in here. And we can think of this range of tone as the tones being available to us if we're using oils or acrylic. Now, sweeping statement, I would say that if we're using watercolour, the range of tones available to you are probably just going to be here. I mean, and we could debate that endlessly as well, but I'm just talking generally here. So when you're using watercolour, generally speaking, you're not going to be able to achieve, or at least not without a lot of work, let's put it that way, a very, very dark tone in the way you can easily do with oil and acrylic. And then furthermore, you know, you can always cover up your mistakes or your you can undo previous decisions if you want to think of it that way in oil and, oil and acrylic much more easily than you can with watercolour. So we need to keep this in mind that we're working with a, in general, smaller tonal range of so smaller range of tonal values and in general you're not going to be able to go as dark with watercolour as you can easily with oil and acrylic. So how does that impact the painting that we might create? So having just discussed that there's a bit of a limitation in terms of the tonal range you can achieve with watercolour, let's sort of chat about how to deal with that situation. Well, the first thing is, I would say, is to very much embrace just how pale and faint and, you know, almost sort of barely there in terms of tone and effects, the different colours and things that you can achieve with watercolour. And one of the ways to kind of maximise that sort of almost mist-like quality is to really just douse the paper with water right from the beginning. And then, you know, very much, you want to very much embrace the fact that you can't really control watercolour. That's the beauty of the medium. So I'm going to do a little painting now, just a little sketch, but I'm only going to use burnt umber. So this is the same burnt umber that I was using previously for the demo, just a little bit squeezed out of the tube, gone to a nice big mop brush. And you can see that I'm just putting the colour on very, in a very, very pale way onto that wet surface. And then if you want to, you know, you can even spray some water onto that. You can play around and just see what different effects you get with the, the very palest addition of paint onto a wet surface. So what are we going to have in our scene? Well, we're still going to stay pale, but maybe there's some kind of um, skyline here. So this isn't really the best brush for it because uh, if I want to get sharp corners, but you know, it's just a demo. So, and an experimental one at that. So maybe there's some kind of church there. And some kind of a tree line. A couple of rooftops. Some kind of structure there. I don't know what that is, but we'll just kind of let the paint do its own thing. And I'm going to let that dry completely now. OK, well, that first layer of paint is pretty dry. Um, I've switched to a flat brush now and I'm going to just put a wall in here. So I'm using a fairly dilute mix of the paint. But I'm going to just put some kind of wall, or I said wall, maybe I'll do a fence actually. Perhaps that's going to be more helpful for what I'm going to show you. So what I'm establishing here 
is we, we can almost think of it as a stage really if, if you are I'm, I'm not a great theater expert but i know you have a backdrop okay so that's what i've done with the first layer of paint and then on stage you've typically got some props which are in front of the backdrop so that's what i'm putting in now the fence is going to act we can think of it as the prop on the stage and it, because that's in front of the backdrop it's going to be somewhat darker in tone than the backdrop I don't know who built this fence, but he's, uh, he or she didn't do a very good job of spacing out the posts very well. But uh, I'm just the artist, so I can't be blamed for that. Um, OK, so we've got a post there and uh, some uh, sorry, some kind of weird fence. It's not very realistic, is it? But um, it doesn't really matter too much for what I'm doing. Let's put a few uh, bits of grass in or something. So the point is we've got some object which is now in front of the background but then perhaps there's a figure here and perhaps this figure is standing i mean i wouldn't particularly want to do this in terms of a composition perhaps but perhaps he's yeah you know, they're standing in front of the the fence um or at least partially in front of the fence and you know how are we going to deal with that in terms of tone especially as we're only using one color well now this is where we can begin to use the paint more or less straight out of the tube. So, you know, I'll come over here, I think, just to make my life a little bit easier. So perhaps the person's wearing some kind of hat, a fedora or something. So they're more or less in shadow and we think just in terms of silhouette for the most part we can block in the the presence of a figure Or the beginnings of one at least now um, at the moment there's not much of a tonal difference between the figure and the fence but it is definitely the figure is definitely you know standing in front of the background using that very very pale wash to begin with really pushes the background back and helps give you a sense of depth and now having established our figure terms of its location in the painting I can now come in with my burnt umber but this time fresh out of the tube and add some areas of you know much darker tone and obviously this is just you know very simple um, very simplified way of creating a, a picture but hopefully you know the, the basic technique is going to come across so I can really, by putting the paint on straight out of the tube, even if I've only got one colour and even if I'm using watercolour, I can begin to add some patches of real dark. So now that I'm thinking about this a bit more, perhaps I'll make the right hand side of the figure considerably darker than the left. 
So I've got my shadow. That's gone a bit wrong on the leg, but uh, again, you know, we'll have to live with that. And then, you know, I can put a bit of a cast shadow here. And hopefully, you know, it's not my, my it's not my best work, but you know, hopefully, you can see that fairly quickly. And just using one color, this is the point. Um, you know, I've been able to create a sense of depth quite quickly with watercolor and with quite a simplified approach. So lots of water, very pale for the background. Let that dry and then using, a, you know, some water for the mid ground, the props on the stage. This is our backdrop. This is the prop. But for the main player, you want that person or animal or thing, whatever it is, you want it in the foreground. And if it was on the stage, it would be under a strong spotlight. So one technique you can do, and I would recommend doing it rather better than I have, but you can create a sense of light by increasing the sense of light and dark and strengthening cast shadows and things. And even if you've only got one color, if you're using the tube watercolor, you use that straight out of the tube and you that allows you to bring the figure forward. Now, if you're a bit you know, strapped for cash or you just don't want to invest in tube watercolors straight away, then a good tip is that if you've got a set of pans like this and you want to you know, strengthen some tone, then get yourself a tube of neutral tint. Um, okay, so as the name implies, neutral tint, and it, you know, it literally says it on the, that's not my name for it, that's the name of the paint. Um, as the name implies, it's a true neutral. It's a very dark tint if you use it neat, but you can add it to any color and it will give you minimal color shift when you add it. And so what you can do just to get going if you want to is you can you know use your pan kit like I've got here I mean I use this all the time and then you know, just squeeze a bit of neutral tint into the lid and then you can probably do the backdrop stage and the mid-ground stage in the way I've done using the pans and then when you want to get these really dark tones then you can just add the neutral tint in and that will give you the thicker paint for whatever color you choose and that's a really nice way to just kind of get into this way of thinking and this way of working. And what I would say is just finally, is that this technique doesn't have to apply to a landscape only. If you had this chap standing in front of a doorway or a brown brick wall, which was very close to him, our job as artists in general is to exaggerate a bit. So I would still use this general technique to enhance the sense of depth, even if that depth isn't actually there in reality. But anyway, I hope some of these little experiments and little sketches have helped you see how we can treat tonal value in watercolour and colour value and just kind of get used to the medium. If you've got any questions at all, please feel free to ask me in the comments below. And thanks very much for watching.